All right. Um, thanks for joining my talk. Um, in this talk, I will talk about uh, the title is Angular the Redux Way, and we're looking at some general state uh, management topics. But then in the end, we're more looking at NGRX Store, which is a one implementation for implementing a Redux kind of pattern within Angular. Um, first of all, uh, this is kind of a bold statement, but state is really sometimes your biggest enemy when you're developing an application. You can just have so many issues uh, with state in your application. And these are just a few of them. So synchronization is, is an issue, for example, in client-server architectures. If you're having state on your server and on your client and you kind of need to synchronize this state, you can get into a state of where you're not syn synchronized anymore, right? Or if you have a distributed state and you need to synchronize uh, the state between these different distributions, right? So this can also lead to a lot of issues. Dependencies are usually a problem in state, so one state is depending on the other state. What do you do when this state updates? You need to update also the other state. So it can just lead to a lot of messy code. State transitions, right? So if you have something like a process where you're going through or your user are going through in a user interface, and then you need to transition between different states, so that can also be a, a big issue in your, in your code. Mutability is also an, a big issue, so of course we, if you're using object references in our state and then we're just updating the state somewhere, maybe we have another reference from somewhere else and then we're just updating something that we actually don't want. And generally, a lot of times in our state architecture, it leads to some kind of a non-determinism. So over time, you cannot really predict what your application state is and how it came there, right? And that's a huge problem because when you're looking at your application, you should always be able to uh, tell exactly what's going on, right? It should be completely deterministic. And that's really not the case with uh, most application architectures. So first of all, let's look at the an anatomy of, of state. And we can actually talk about this a little bit. So, as an example, uh, I would like to bring up the question, why do we even need client state, right? So in a client-server architecture, why do we need client state? Is there any reason for using client state? Couldn't we just store all the state on the server, right? Like something like JSF or something uh, in that area, right? So if we do a little experiment and we're developing a small to-do app, um, it could look something like this, right? So we're clicking a to-do to, to mark it as done, but then it takes a second in order to get marked. And also the second to-do, if you want to tick it off, it just takes time until the server responses with the update, right? So if we don't use any client state, we're going to have some kind of a an issue here, right? Because if we're performing a change, this change first needs to go to the server, and then maybe even if some, you know, uh, if a lot of stuff has been updated and we don't include in the payload of the response the updated state, we even need to do another call to the server to get the updated list of to-dos, let's say. And that just takes a lot of time, right? And if you're building your application like this, the user will actually have a very bad experience. And that's basically because the perceived performance of your application is very bad, right? So if, you if I, as a user, click somewhere, I want to see an immediate feedback, right? So I want to see that this, what I've done is actually done. Um, also, I have a lot of glitches in such an application because if I start to click around and do a lot of tasks, and this needs synchronization with the server before I see it, I may end up in a dead end, right? Because I'm clicking all around and everything gets delayed. It can really lead to problems. Another issue is with uh, server 
state only if I add it to do in this example. And I don't see it. So I need to switch to project two. And I'm switching to project one again, because that is triggering a, le a reload of, of my to-do list. And here the issue is if we have, my, I mean, if we are really uh, building our application from components, what we should do, we have maybe two components, like a project component and a to-dos component. Now the to-dos component is fetching the initial list of data, and it's visualizing that, it's showing that to the user. And then suddenly you're updating the list by adding a new to-do on the server, but this is done from the project component, right? And then suddenly your to-do component is out of sync because you're only relying on a server state. You don't store anything in the client, so the client doesn't really know if you're updating from one component something to the server. Maybe that component can be updated, but the rest of your components in the application, they have no clue what's, what's happening. So this is more of a distribution and synchronization issue. So if we're having a distributed state or if you have a lot of components and they rely on the same server state, um, we kind of need additional synchronization. So in order to solve this, we could use something called client persistent state. And client persistent state can be implemented in many ways, of course. But in this example, we are making use of RxJS because that is already coming with Angular. So we're actually, we can make use of that in an Angular application. And we're using a behavior subject, which is an observer and an observable at the same time. And we're using that behavior subject in order to build up kind of a cache in the client that is just caching whatever is on the server. So if we have that behavior subject, when we're doing an update to the server and the server responds, we can actually publish this update in this behavior subject and all the subs subscribed components, they will be updated uh, by this change, right? What we can also do is kind of an optimistic update using that behavior subject. So instead of just relying on the server to answer, we can already update our local persistent state and rely on the server to correct our optimistic update, let's say. So this could look something like this. We have a to-dos list here, which is a behavior subject uh, of type to-dos array. And in our constructor of this uh, service, we are calling the load to-dos uh, method. And inside of the load to do's method, all we do is we do an HTTP call to the server to get the to do's list. And then we're subscribing to that observable. And we are calling this to do's next. And with the next method, we can actually uh, publish something on that behavior subject. So like this, we're can, we can all the subscribe components, they actually obtain the, as an event the updated list of to do's, which is really great because then we can have hundreds of components subscribing to this list, and they all will be in sync if something is uh, getting updated from the server. And then we can do something like an optimistic update, right? So instead of directly, this is the add to do method, right? Instead of directly calling the server to post a new to do, what we're doing is we're doing kind of an optimistic update. So we're pushing kind of a dummy to do into our to do list or in the observable stream of our our list or in the behavior subject and we're just concatenating what's what's existing already we can do that by getting the current value of the behavior sub subject by calling get value which is not so uh, much used and and loved in the functional world world because it kind of causes side effects or it's a side effect but with this method, we can optimistically update our client state, and then we can just rely on the server to update the correct values once the request is, uh, is done or once the response comes in. And this is really great in some situations, as in this user phase, because now we can tick off the to-dos. These updates go in as optimistic updates, and one, once we add to-dos, it's also added immediately, and we see the change. And when the server responds with the correct answer or with the correct update, we're just overwriting what we did optimistically in our client's persistent state. 
So actually, we can uh, think of state in kind of two fashions. There is a persistent state and there is a transient state. And in the client, uh, we also have a persistent state in the client, right? There is a lot of state or ways how we can persist state in the client. And there is this uh, persistent, persistent state that we just saw, which helps us to synchronize state to the server, where we can also leverage concepts like optimistic updates. And I think we shouldn't think of um, persistency as either persistent or transient. It's, it's more like a gradient, right? So we have things that are highly trans transient, and we have thi things that are highly persistent. But there are also things in between, right? So we shouldn't only think about uh, only persistent or transient, but it's somewhere in between. For example, the state of a mobile menu, right? If we expand the mobile menu in the UI, in the user interface, in the browser, this is maybe a very transient state, right? We don't need to store it in, in, in any way. But the password of a user, for example, or a document the user uploaded, is actually very persistent, right? It's stored in a very, very persistent way. And I, I always like to think about, when I think about state of the lifespan requirement of a state, right? So what's the lifespan requirement of uh, an accordion if it's collapsed or expanded, right? There is just not so much requirement for a long lifespan. You don't want to save this in a, in a database if the user has expanded the mobile menu or something like this, right? However, other things like documents that are uploaded or the password of a user, has actually a very long lifespan, right? And what we need to be aware is that usually everything that has a very long lifespan is also very hard to obtain, right, and to manage. Because you need to do a server call, the server needs to consult a data store or a file or whatever, so it takes a lot of time. And there we need to kind of build, uh, build a bridge for the user experience because uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot show the user that this needs so much time. So the next topic is um, centralized reactive state. And we were going to look at some approaches. And maybe the most popular design right now is uh, called the Flux application architecture, which was uh, designed uh, by Facebook. And the Flux data architecture is really, really nice because it's so simple, but it solves really so many problems. And we're going to look into a lot of examples now. The basics are very easy. Um, from the view, I can dispatch so-called actions. And these actions are dispatched using to a dispatcher. And the dispatcher is actually then updating some state I have stored in stores. And so this is, I'm not directly modifying state within this architecture. I'm dispatching actions, structured actions, that tell the dispatcher this is the action, for example, adding a to-do. And then I have some payload with this action. And then inside of the dispatcher, the modification of the state will be done based on this information, right? So it's a very controlled way how to manage your state, how to manage your data. And after that change is done, the store will actually reflect these updated, the updated state into the view of your application again. So that's one of the things of this architecture. It's really unidirectional, right? So the view is causing an action or triggering an action, and an action, and then this action is going through the dispatcher, and the store is updated. So Flux is actually implemented in many uh, implementations. Uh, the most popular one is probably Redux, uh, and you know that probably from, from React, but Redux can be used uh, not only in React, of course, it can be used anywhere. And you can see all these other libraries here or, or implementations. There are many more, but there is Reflux, Fluxor, Flumox, and I mean, from these names, maybe they're very creative libraries, but in the naming, maybe they were not so much creative. But um, if we look at the history a little bit to come to the main topic that we're looking at, which is NGRX Store, 
uh, you can see this is maybe like the influence, influence map uh, how NGRX Store was created. And uh, Redox was highly influenced by Elm, which is from about 2012, I think, uh, and Flux, the Flux data architecture. So these were the two uh, main influences for, for the Redox library. And then NGRX Store, they took this to a next level, I think, uh, because they took the concept of Redox and combined it with the reactive way how you do things with RxJS, with streams, right, with obser observable streams. And that's really, really a, a great combination because then we have, the, we have the concept of a centralized state, but it's combined with the reactiveness of RxJS, which gives us, it gives us a, a great flexibility by using operators, but also um, it's really efficient be, because we can always react on, on changes. So the NGRX store architecture is actually um, also pretty simple. Uh, if we are looking at it from a, from a higher level. And from the view, so this is similar to the, the, the Flux concept, we're dispatching actions, but in, in uh, NGRX or in Redox, we're dispatching the actions to the store, and then the store is actually forwarding or delegating this action uh, into so-called reducers. And reducers, they are just pure functions that take two arguments. One is the current application state, and the other argument is the action itself. And then the reducer function is producing a new output state for your application. So you give it the current state, an action, and it gives you the resulting state, right? That's a, that's a reducer function. And then this output state is going back into your store, where it's effectively then distributed to your view because you can subscribe to the store changes. It's an observable, right? So you can subscribe to these changes with Angular, even in the view using the async pipe. So that's how actions would look like if we are implementing them in NGRX store. They're actually pretty simple. The only contract that you have from the action interface is that you implement this type field which should be a string, and it helps you to distinguish between the different actions, right? So in the reducer, you will then uh, check for this type property in order to see what should be performed, what action should be performed. So every action has also a payload, and I mean, you don't need necessarily a payload. Some actions, they don't have a payload, right? For example, the action of clearing all to-dos in a list. You don't need additional data or information to execute this action, right? If you need to clear the whole list, you don't need additional data. So you don't need payload for that. But other actions like updating a to-do, you might need payload like the, uh, the to-do ID and the data that you want to use to update this specific to-do item. This is how you dispatch an action using NGRX store. So you just call store.dispatch and you're passing your action that you want to dispatch. And then this is the interface for the reducer function. And as I said before, it's really simple. Uh, you have just two parameters. The first one is the current application state. So the store, when it delegates to the reducer, when you dispatch an, ex an action, it will pass the current application state and and also the action that you use when you dispatch. And based on that, the reducer will be able to produce a new output state. So if the action is adding a to-do, and your current state is an empty list, then the reducer knows, okay, I take this empty list of the current state, add a new to-do with the data from the action, and then I return the whole state as a new outcome state. And that's the beautiful thing about uh, reducers, they're pure, right? So when you call them with the same state and the same action, the output, the output state will always be the same, right? So they're absolutely deterministic. And this is how you would implement a reducer. So in this example, we have a very simple counter state. And on that counter state, we have a count uh, field. We also create a constant or an object that is kind of the initial counter state where we set count to zero. And in the reducer, we can use a pattern. We can use a default value for our state. So if by any chance 
the reducer is called with undefined uh, as a first argument, so no state is passed, we're just using the initial state. And the second argument is that action, and it needs to return a new counter state. So we're passing in a state and we're getting out a state. Inside of the reducer, and that's a pattern that is uh, coming from, from Redux, so we're using switch case to switch on the action types, and then we're just performing the action that is required. So the reducer is actually the element in this whole thing uh, which is producing or which is, uh, uh, you know, modifying your state. And this is how you get data out of the st uh, store or out of your state. So since NGRX uh, uses observables, what we can do is we can call store.select, which is effectively just a map function, an observable map uh, it's equivalent to observable map, so we're passing a mapping function where we always receive the global state, and then we can just sub-select a substate or select the substate, and then we, we get a new observable that is pointing to that substate. And when there are changes, uh, we will always get the latest values like this. Okay, and. Really, the most beautiful thing about this whole thing, Flux, but also NGRX, is that it is so simple, but it is so powerful at the same time, because it will fix most of your state issues that we looked, in the first we looked at in the first slide. And because it's so simple, I want to show you that we can implement our own NGRX um, with only 25 lines of code. So in order to implement our own NGRX, um, we are starting with the action interface. So we're building a few interfaces now in order to have everything type safe and document it at the same time. So we're having an action with a field type, which is of type string. And the next interface is actually uh, the reducer function. So we call it, uh, we're creating an interface for the reducer function. We're using two generics. One is for the state type, and the other one is for the action type. And the reducer function itself, as we saw before, has two parameters. First one is the state, and the second one is an action. And the result, the return value, is also a new state. right? And then we're creating another interface in order to help us with uh, selecting substates, right? So we're creating a selector interface, which has also a generic that represents the state and another one that represents the return value when we subselect the state, so the, the value or the type from the substate. So here we can pass a selector function or a mapping function, which will receive the state and produce uh, or, or return a value from the state, and it produces an observable of that value type. So that's our selector function. So now, finally, the last interface. Uh, we're creating an interface for our store objects. So whenever we create a new store, and the store object has two generics. One is state type, and the other one is uh, action type. On the store, we're adding two methods. The first one is the select method, which is just of type selector function that we just created before. And the second method is the dispatch method, right? In order to dispatch actions from the store, we're adding this method, which is really simple, a method or a function where we can pass an action and it doesn't return anything. So now we're implementing our store, and we do that by using a factory function. So we're creating a factory function called <coughs> create store. And create store is using the two generics that we're using here quite frequently for the state type and the action type. And we have two parameters in this function. The first one is actually the reducer that the user wants to use with this specific store, which is of type reducer, reducer function. And the second argument is an optional argument for the initial 
state that we want to have in our store. So we can pass an initial state so that our application has a state initially. The return value of create store, obviously, because it's a factory function, is a store. So now inside of our factory function, we're kind of building up the heart of our store, which is a behavior subject. So we're using a behavior subject inside of our store to emit changes of the state of our application. So you can see the behavior subject is of generic type S, which is our state type. And we're initializing our behavior subject with the initial, the optional initial state. Initial state. And we're calling that changes because it emits all the changes of our state. And finally, we just need to return our state object, which is conforming to the, uh, sorry, our store object, which is conforming to the store interface, and implement these two uh, methods or functions. So the select function is really simply a map, right? So we're, we can actually just do a map here. So we get the selector, which is a mapping function, selector parameter of this arrow function. We're converting the changes to an observable. And then we are piping that observable using the map operator and just pass the selector, because the selector is a mapping function. And the second uh, method we are implementing is the dispatch method. And here we are getting the action that we want to dispatch. Then we are accessing changes, and now the tricky part starts. Well, it's not so tricky. With next, we can emit a value on the behavior subject, but we're not calling next directly. Instead, we're calling the reducer that was passed to the factory function in order to create a new store. And we're calling the reducer with the current state of our application, which we get by calling changes.getValue and the action that was dispatched. So the reducer will then create the new state, and this new state we will emit through the behavior subject. And that's already all we need to create NGRX. I mean, in its simplest form, of course. But this is already working, and with the example from before, with the counter state example and our reducer, we could now create a new store and use this already in, a, in an application uh, by creating a store using our factory function create store. We pass the reducer, we pass our initial state, and this is already uh, working. Inside of a component, if we then want to use this state and modify this state using our own, own implementation of NGRX, we could just get something from the state by calling store.select. And here we're getting the substate, which is this uh, count, the count uh, state, which is of, then of type observable number, right? Because the count is just a number. And if we use the awesome async pipe in Angular in the view, we can directly subscribe to this observable within the view of our component. So the subscription is happening there. And then if we click the button to increment the counter, we're calling the increment uh, method on our component, which is then just calling store.dispatch and passing the action increment action, increment counter action, which is uh, handled in the reducer, right? As we saw before in the example. So Flux is really like balm for the soul of your application. If you're using a Flux architecture and you scale it up, you're going to recognize that it's really, really doing a lot of good for your application. It's a centralized state, right? So you don't need to search for distributed state in your application. You always know where your state is. It's highly, or it's unidirectional. So all your data is flowing in a unidirectional way. The view is sending actions to the store, and the store is then... Um, updating the data using the reducers that you have configured. Reducers are pure functions, and that is, for me, I believe, maybe the best thing about this whole concept of Redux and NGRX, is that these functions, they are so predictable. If you're writing tests for your application, you can just uh, 
you can just call the reducer with a, a state that you put together and the action, and you should be able to see all the behavior that is really, really in a, in a pure way, right? So when you call it with the same state and same action, the outcome should always be the same. And it's really simple to reason about if you're building your application like this because um, of this high predictability and determinism, uh, you can always really say what your application does. And because it's so uh, simple and nice, um, we would like to now also implement this awesome Redux replay feature that you, I'm sure you have seen a lot of times but we're going to implement it in our own implementation that we just produced before with only seven lines of code. So this is the implementation from before. The only thing that we're going to change is we, we're going to add a new uh, replay history function to our store interface. And there we can just pass an interval, which is a time interval that is getting that is used to replay the state with some delay, right? So every state changes. Uh, replayed with a little delay. Inside of our factory function, we're just adding a history, which is simply a list of states, right? And then we subscribe to the changes, so whenever there is a state change, we, we subscribe directly in the factory in order to see or to get all the changed states and just push them into this history. And now we're going to use some RxJS magic to create a replay history function. So here we are getting the interval as per the interface, right? And we're using the from helper, the observable from helper, to create a stream of items from our history array. So every item in the, in the array will be turned into a stream item. And then we pipe that stream through a zip helper where we use a timer to offset each individual item by a given amount of milliseconds. And then we're just subscribing to that new stream that we produce here. And we're using our changes again to emit these individual states that then get, you know, delayed on a time axis a little bit and replayed. So this is maybe not the best idea, because now if you would replay again, the replayed replay would replay again, right? But I mean, for this demonstration, it doesn't really matter. So if you look at the application like this, um, we can update some to-dos now in our list, add a new to-do. So this is all happening through actions, of course, now, with our own implementation. We can even switch projects and add a to-do there. And you already see maybe we have a new button there on the bottom, replay history. So this is just calling the store replace history function that we just created. And if we do that, you can see that the whole state changes we have applied now in the UI are just replayed to our user interface. And of course, this is not a feature that you could use in production. But what it really shows is that your whole application is really, really simple to reason about. If you can replay states and your user interface shows states from your history, then the architecture, that's a, it's kind of a proof for the architecture, right? Because then it's so highly deterministic that something like this can actually happen or can be done easily with seven lines of code, right? So with a total of... 32 lines of code, we have rebuilt NGRX with a replay function even, right? Which is awesome, because that proves it's really, really a good concept. So what about asynchronous actions? So far, we have only seen uh, synchronous stuff. Of course, the to-dos were synchronized to the server, but our actions were all synchronous. So you could really go very simply about this. Um, Whenever you complete an asynchronous operation, no matter where you're performing the operation, you can just call store.dispatch, right? So we're loading a to-do list from the server, and when we are done, we're dispatching an action, and the action is updating the data in the store, the state in the store. 
However, then you will start creating a lot of services and they do all sorts of crazy things and then dispatch actions and you're also losing a little bit control. And there is a solution for this with NGRX. Um, it's a little helper library called NGRX Effects and it helps you to kind of manage these asynchronous effects in a very controlled manner. So this is the architecture of NGRX effects. Um, it's really simple. Effects act like a stream. They're going to receive actions, and if they think they need to do something with one of these actions, they're going to pipe these actions through, and they're going to produce a new output action. So they're more like a pipe. Something gets in into the effect, an action gets into the effect, then something happens, maybe something asynchronous, not necessarily, but maybe. And then after a while, the effect spits out a new uh, action. And this action is automatically dispatched to the store, so you don't need to dispatch it manually. And that's the whole idea of, of effects in, in NGRX. So the implementation would look like this. The effect is actually put into a service, so you, you're creating a, an injectable class. And inside of that, you are creating effects by using the effect decorator that comes from NGRX effects. And we're also using something called actions here. The actions is actually coming from NGRX effects, and it's just an observable that emits all the actions within your application that were uh, emitted, right? So whenever you dispatch an action, uh, this actions observable will actually emit or uh, you can you can observe this this action coming through this actions uh, observable um, When we have that or when we when now we could really react on all sorts of actions right every action that get dispatched in our store we can handle here and then we can use a, a helper that comes from uh, NGRX effects which is called off type and that just how it's kind of a filter so we could also write filter and then action action dot type equals uh, low to do action that's actu actually the same right off type is just uh, a little helper so we're only taking care of load to do's action and then what we're doing is we're using merge map in order to so that's all rxjs so we're using merge map in order to start another observable stream and kind of merge it back into the original stream. So like this, we can extend our asynchronous operation by involving another stream. And we do that because we want to do an HTTP call. And the result of that HTTP call, we take that and we map that into a new action. And that's the set to do's action, right? So effectively, you could say about this effect, it takes a load to do's action, does something, and then it's mapping to a set to do's action. And then this action is actually dispatched to the store. So in your view, that would now look like this. So you just use now dispatch in order to load some data. So you're not involving a service anymore. You're just calling store.dispatch load to do's action. And that will trigger the side effect. And the side effect will load the data call another action and your state will be updated and reflected into the view using observables and subscriptions directly in your view. All right, so now I want to look at a few patterns and I think it's really interesting uh, with Redux and NGRX, so how you're dealing with this state there, they, there have emerged some patterns of how do you treat certain problems in, in state architectures like this, right? So you could even write a, a pattern book about how to create state for uh, immutable, uh, not immutable, uh, infinite scrolling or a load more button or any kind of task you have in a user interface sometimes you can see some common patterns that you can really describe as a pattern to be used with NGRX store or Redux. And I've just uh, put out four of these patterns now here, I think, but there are many more, and it would be really interesting 
to actually create maybe a website even to collect all these patterns. And if you are working with Redox or NGRX Store already, I would be really interested after the talk if we could talk about your experiences and maybe some patterns that you are using. So the first per pattern I want to talk about is asynchronous operations with error handling, right? So usually when we load something from a server, something could go wrong, right? And then we have an error. And in a traditional application, sometimes it's really hard to handle these errors, not because of the error handling, but because you're using distributed state. And once one part of the state is corrupted, you never know how to fix your whole application with all the state. Where is the state corrupted, right? If you distribute your state, it's going to be really hard to recover. So you could just restart like Erlang, right? Or you could use a centralized state management where errors happen in a very controlled manner, right? So when we have an asynchronous operation with error handling pattern, what we're doing is we're calling or we're dispatching an action called load items action in this example. The reducer will handle this action immediately, but at the same time, the effect will also handle the action. So the effect will do something with the action as well. And after a while, when the action, the asynchronous action or the asynchronous effect is done, it will either map to a load success action or a load failed action based on the outcome, right? If there is an error, we'll have a load failed action with some payload, maybe the error. And if everything went fine, we have a load success action. So if you look at the state for this example or for this pattern, it could look something like this. We have a loading flag. We have an errors list, which is just a list of strings now in this example, and uh, the items list, the effective items list. The side effect would look something like this. So we have, uh, we're filtering for load items actions. And we're again using merge map to merge in another stream. But here, this time, we're calling HTTP get, but we're not only handling the success case, we're also using catch error in order to handle the failure case, right? When we have a, an error coming from the server. So in our success case, we're then mapping to a load success action, uh, action and passing the items, which is coming from the payload from the get request. And in the failure action, we're just dispatching or mapping to a new load failed action, which is really controlled. Now we can implement the reducer that just handles these different actions, right? In the load items action, that is actually to cause the side effect to load the data, the only thing we're doing is we're setting loading to true. And this is happening instantly, right? When, when, once this action is dispatched, we're setting loading to true. And then once we receive the load success action coming from the, the side effect, we're setting loading to false and the items to the to the items that we receive by the action, which effectively come from the server. If something is failing, we could do something like uh, just setting loading to false again, of course, because if it, there is an error, we also stop loading, hopefully. And this is the moment where in some traditional state distribution, you see spinners going all, uh, all along. When, when the application had the error, you see the spinner still spinning for forever, actually. So within an architecture like this, this could never happen, actually. And we are pushing the error into the errors list here in, this, in our state. Another pattern is the optimistic update. So in that case, we are also the action is also uh, handled by the reducer and by the side effect. And then the side effect in this case is not handling the error. You could handle the error as well, but we're just uh, uh, dispatching or mapping to a server update action once the, the optimistic update went through. Our state is pretty simple here. Again, we have an updating flag and the item that we want to update. And in our effect, uh, what we're doing is we're just doing the asynchronous operation to update our item on the server. So we're filtering for optimistic update action. And we're calling uh, API items with the, with the post, pass the data from the action. The server gave us the answer. And when we got the response that everything went fine, we're uh, mapping to a new server update action, passing the payload from the server. In our state, however, what we're doing 
For the optimistic update action, which is also handled by the effect, we're also setting updating to true, but then we are updating our item in the cl client persistent state. So this is now this client persistent state, right? So we're optimistically updating our, our local state item. And when the server then returns with the real update, we set updating to false and update the item uh, that comes from the server. There is also more patterns like a load more button we can quickly look at. So we have a load more action, then we, uh, in this time, the load more action is not directly handled by the reducer. The mapped action from the effect is then handled by the reducer. In this example, we just have an empty items uh, array in the beginning. And when we're loading data from the server, all we, knew, all we do here is we're doing something that we didn't saw before, so we're combining the action that comes in with something from the state, which is also an observable, right? And then we're basically um, combining that so we can get the current list size from our state and use that in our GET request in order to specify how many items or where we want to start loading additional items. And then we just pass that and the answer, we're going to use the answer to append more items to our items list, right? So here in the reducer, we're just passing more items. And there is another example with a process step. It's kind of an uh, affinite state machine-like uh, pattern where you're using kind of step type interface using a union type, and then you can just jump from step to step in your state. So that's the idea, and maybe collect some data on the way. And in order to do that, uh, we don't even need an effect. You can directly do that in the reducer. We can do, create a sub switch inside of the action type switch, where we switch for the action step kind. And there we can deci decide, do I need to go to the next step or to the previous step? And all these kind of things that you have in a finite state machine. So the conclusion is really that, or what shines most about Flux and Redux is that it's really simple. You saw it, right? We, we built it together with uh, 32 lines of code. But the impact it has on the, on the determinism of your application and the, the cleanness is really, really fantastic. And it's always hard to tell about this because I think you can only uh, really know about it if you experience the effect on your own. So if you're using it in your own application, mid-size to large size, you're really going to experience the benefits of it. So this is my company. I just founded my company a month ago, and I'm doing some uh, consulting and uh, also workshops or implementation um, in these kind of areas. So I'm only doing stuff in the front end. I'm a pure front end developer. And uh, if you, I, I'm always looking for people who are like-minded and uh, need some help maybe with some topics on Angular or NGRX. So if you have some uh, stuff to discuss, please come to me after the talk. Thank you. I think we don't have time for questions, but if you have questions, you can of course come to me and I'm really happy to talk about this stuff. <laughs>